Insight Transformative Leadership Institute online lecture series featuring 2022 Ramon Magsaysay Awardee for Emergent Leadership, Gary Benchigib. Our young, dynamic, and very spirited awardee from Indonesia. Gary will be sharing with us his journey as he started a movement using his crazy ideas as he and Sungai Watch addresses the plastic pollution problem in Indonesia. He will be joined later by a panel of experts as they share their take on Gary's presentation. After the panel discussion, we will be opening the floor to questions from our audience. You may use the various available platforms on Zoom, on Facebook, and on YouTube for your questions. To formally open our event, please all welcome to our green, the president of the Ramon Magsaysay Award Foundation, Ms. Susan B. Afan. Thank you, Helen, and hello, everyone. We have a very, very exciting afternoon ahead of us. The Ramon Magsaysay Transformative Leadership Institute's lecture series is one of the very exciting highlights of our awards festival season. Through our lecture series, the public is given a one-of-a-kind opportunity to access our Ramon Magsaysay laureates. It is also a chance for all of us to learn about their unique leadership journeys and extraordinary work. The Ramon uh, Magsaysay Award as well, uh, we have the pleasure and privilege to listen and engage today with one of the region's youngest heroes, Gary Benchigib. And in the next two hours, we will learn how he has used his youthful zeal, his passion and creativity, and his strongest of convictions in his fight against plastic pollution and climate injustice. Well, sharing my excitement this afternoon are members of the Ramon Magsaysay Award Foundation's Board of Trustees. Thank you so much for joining us, including Cheche Lazaro who will also serve as our lead panelist. We at the foundation, obviously, are very blessed to have Cheche on our board. The first Ramon Magsaysay Awards were given out in 1958 to outstanding individuals and organizations who exemplify what we call greatness of spirit. Greatness of spirit comes in various forms. It knows no boundaries, no race, no age, no gender, no limits. In our second year of our foundation's existence, that was in 1959, we found greatness of spirit in a very young 24-year-old man from Tibet who was fighting for his people's freedom and culture. That young man today is known as His Holiness, the Dalai Lama. He received the Ramon Magsaysay Award, his very first award, whether local or international, at that time. He has since become a global icon of peace. This year, in our 64th year, we again found greatness of spirit in another young person, Gary Benchigib. At a young age, Gary was exposed to the harsh realities of the environmental problems in Bali, Indonesia. He realized that his age is not a hindrance for him to contribute to solving this issue. Decoding the solution of this problem is not an easy task. It involves guts, sheer determination, passion, and wild imagination to think of ways to solve the problem. And as Gary would say, it takes crazy ideas to make these things happen. This afternoon, we will all learn about how he has used his crazy ideas to address environmental problems. Chief among them is plastic pollution and how his crazy ideas have resulted in unbelievable and amazing results. Friends, please welcome 
2022 Ramon Magsaysay Awardee for Emergent Leadership, Gary Benchikil. Gary, good afternoon. How are you? Good afternoon. It's a, a huge honor to be here today uh, with all of you. And what an amazing introduction. Thank you so much for this. Uh, wh where are you right now? And what's the weather wherever you are? It, uh, you know, it's, it's been pouring rain, but right when the session started um, in Bali, it just stopped. So uh, you won't hear any thunder or anything like that. We're, we're, we're all set <laughs> to go. The gods of Bali are with us. Okay, wonderful, wonderful. Well, let's get down to business. So to minimize any kind of technological glitches, we have requested Gary to pre-record his public lecture. After the video, he will rejoin us for the live panel discussion and the Q&A. We now request everyone to please turn off their cameras and mics as we view the lecture. My name is Gary. And I'm so honored, you know, to have been given and granted the Raman Max Ace Award this year for Emergent Leadership. You know, this is probably one of the most, the biggest honor in my entire life. It's been such a festive, you know, couple of weeks leading up to festival season that is coming up in the next two weeks. And it is a giant honor today to be speaking to you all, addressing you from Bali. You know, this may be a little bit different to other lectures that the Raman Max Ace has hosted. We're actually right here in the mangroves of South Bali in what is literally a plastic apocalypse. For the next 20 minutes, we're gonna be showcasing the journey of Sunai Watch, uh, my personal journey of using media, using simple solutions to address an issue very dear to me, which is plastic, and how, you know, when my brother and sister, Sam and Kelly, were trying to rid the ocean and rivers in general out of plastic waste. So we'll be taking you from source to sea, um, you know, on our journey, and hope that you can enjoy this next 20 minutes. One of our first stops is here in a traditional Balinese market where plastics is used literally everywhere. You know, these here are some single-use, multi-layered plastic packaging for things like shampoo and detergents. Here in Indonesia, you know, we tend to wrap plastics in mono use in these little sachets the truth is that you know most indonesians out there live on two to three dollars a day and cannot afford to buy bulk so you know by packing it in smaller dosages we can cater to a much bigger population but that means ultimately less quantity and more plastic here we can truly understand how much plastics is being used you know from literally seeing these little snacks as well all wrapped in single use plastics as much as you know, plastic bags, which is still readily available here. Now more than ever, we are starting to understand the true impacts on our health with related to plastics. We're ingesting it. It's supposedly said that all of us have microplastics in our stomachs. In fact, we've already found microplastics in our bloodstream, as well as breast milk feeding. So, you know, now is really the time to really look at this material in a completely different light. We all use it, and we have to step away from it. In the next decade, you know, we're set to triple our plastic production globally, and that is truly worrying. Markets like these are a place of transaction, a place where, you know, so much plastics is being readily used. So this is, you know, where we can truly implement reduction schemes. But ultimately, you know, this is where we need to start to track it because as soon as people have purchased, as soon as people are ready to get into the world, back in their houses. Where are they disposing of it? Fortunately, this is way too much of a site here in Indonesia. The National Plastic Action Partnership, a committee you know, looking at plastic pollution founded by the World Economic Forum, estimates that more than 50% of waste management is mismanaged, ending up in illegal landfills like this one, open dumping or openly burnt, or in fact, discarded directly into our rivers. You know, a site like this, whenever it rains with big torrential rainfall, this goes right into our rivers, enters our waterways, making its way to the ocean. And Indonesia is the second biggest plastic polluter to the ocean after China. I think when you see things like this, 
that are so in your face, you know, almost a depressing issue, there are two things you can do, right? You can either walk away and not pay attention to it, thinking that it's somebody else's problem, or you can actually dive deep inside of it and find solutions for it. At a very young age, I thought that with my brother and sister, you know, we need to truly have a solution for this problem because if we don't, more rivers ultimately are going to be trashed. Our coastline here in Bali is going to be choking on plastic. Bali, you know, is one of the most beautiful islands in the world, one of the most desirable spots to travel to. And yet, you know, every rainy season, our main beach here in Bali, just south of here, Pantai Kuta, makes it as one of the trashiest beaches around the world. And Bali has now had this connotation on international media as the island of trash. A couple of years ago, when I was going down the Chitarum River on plastic bottle kayaks with my brother Sam, we were seeing these illegal landfills at every 300 meters, and it was literally chaos. You know, open burning this, thinking that it will go away, is not a solution. And in fact, you know, we really need to start tackling and looking at ways to better engage communities at handling our waste because if we are to treat our rivers like this, we're not set to stop at all the scale of this problem. The truth is that when looking into this plastics, you have a lot of valuable stuff. Things like hard plastics, HDP, that can actually be recycled, shredded, you know, and turned back into products like this. Plastic bags, low value plastics, flexibles that we can also recycle. So after 12 times of cleaning up this illegal landfill, you know, we've worked with a local municipality to install these signs. We're actually giving fines of 500,000 rupiah to 1 million, which is quite significant. You know, that's about $30 to about $80 worth of fines that people throw away. But you know, you look here and it just accumulates. The local government has actually installed a camera that is not functioning, uh, supposedly, otherwise, you know, we would actually be stopping these illegal landfills. So it's a mindset change. It's a radical shift in how we're ending our waste. We're very far away from, you know, being perfect, but it starts by cleaning river by river and cleaning the sources of this real pollution. Rivers are the perfect connection point between life on land and the ocean. There are now our plastic highways. And whenever it rains, you know, you see these waterways literally entirely clogged in plastic. In 2020, we started piloting simple technologies with our nonprofit Songhai Watch to come up with real solutions of how to stop this endless flow of plastics that goes into our ocean. And we came up with a very simple trash barrier design. The beauty about trash barriers is that they've been in existence, you know, for a long time. People, communities, engineers all around the world have been using simple tools like PVC pipes, you know, bamboo or recycle tires to make sure to stop the flow. At Sunai Watch, we now operate 160 barriers just like this one. This is one of our small mini floaters. We have, you know, different types of barriers from big, you know, walkers, we call them, made from blue drums, and they stretch out for about 40 meters rivers, as much as these simple rivers. And every single day, our patrol team comes and clean up every barrier. We use these opportunity to collect as much data as possible to better understand consumption habits. We feel that if we can clean our rivers, you know, at every exit door of a village, we can better understand consumption habits directly at that village to be able to locate data, but ultimately suggest real solutions even before trash ends up in these waterways to begin with. We don't necessarily want to be cleaning rivers every single day. You know, we have no idea what the water composes of, the heavy toxics, the sewage waste, I've personally had, you know, a lot of rushes on my arms and on my legs. And I can assure you that that is not something that you, you take for granted. These barriers can be a great way of getting communities to change their perspective of what we're doing to our planet. Here, you know, this is a very common road. There's a lot of road access. And this is just a visual representation, you know, a symbolism of what we're doing. And some of the first communities that we started to place our barriers into we've actually seen reduction in plastics over the last two years of operating these barriers. And in fact, you know, in three villages, uh, we've actually had to take out the barriers because finally there's no more plastics ending up in them. The awareness level has increased and ultimately, you know, that is the dream scenario. In some other rivers in Denpasar that were once fully clogged in plastic, by placing these barriers, 
it's almost, you know, like a tool to get communities to know that we're watching them. And so this one river in Pemogan in South Anpasar was entirely clogged in plastics. And after seven months of cleaning it up, fish have come back and the water is as clean as ever. So we have the tools that we need. But now, you know, we need to truly understand what it means to get communities involved. One of the ways that we've started this entire movement has been by doing community cleanups. You know, every Friday we would invite local communities, youth groups, women groups, farmer groups in order to start this fight, this war against plastics. In Bali, you know, we have this amazing principle of Trihita Karana, which is the harmony between gods, nature and humans. And I feel, you know, we've been working with a lot of high priests to change the mindset from a cultural perspective, because if we are truly want, you know, to change the way that we respect our rivers, we need to start respecting them as ourselves. Rivers are a perfect reflection of our actions on land and cleaning them up is not going to be the solution. We need to change way before, you know, we are actually dumping plastics in its rivers. Welcome to Student Watch HQ. This is where everything started. We actually started with one ara, so 100 meters squared in the front. We now have 1,200 meters squared. This is one of our main facilities. We now operate six fluid facilities like this in Bali, where trash from the river comes. Uh, you know, this is some of our barriers from the river, uh, different sizes, like we just saw, you know, the mini floaters or small floaters like this, but we can vary them in sizes. So, you know, these guys right here, are a little bit bigger and are for bigger rivers. But ultimately, what really happens here at the Sungai Watch HQ, you know, after trash has been sorted in our various stations, every single day, you know, we collect around three tons of plastics, which is 3,000 kilos. And so here, we process plastics in a secondary process. Once it's been pre sorted in 20 different types of plastics, you know, it includes things like plastic bags, sachets, hard plastics polypropylene, glass, metals, aluminum, then process the second time. So right here, right now, we are looking at bottle caps, which is predominantly you know, HDPE, high density polyethylene. A lot of manual labor to actually pinpoint and sort all of the different plastics that we're collecting. Very much like what we saw this morning, you know, at the local traditional markets, so much of what we collect is also these single-use sachets. And oftentimes these guys are multi-layered, which makes them unrecyclable. So one of the things that, you know, ultimately we can track back are the brands behind some of this unrecyclable plastics. So at Sunai Watch, we're really on a mission to look at data in a completely other way, looking at waste data to basically show who the biggest polluters are. We'll look into all the QR codes, you know, that are in the back of every single piece of plastics, and we'll scan it. We've built an entire, entire database of 30,000 products which link back to about 8,000 brands. The reason why we do this is to engage the other side, polluters, or ultimately the packagers, in a conversation. You know, if every single packager were taxed, we'd be in a very different perspective. Indonesia is on a mission to ban single-use plastics by 2030, and is working with you know, some of these producers to set real roadmaps of action, to try to move away from single-use plastics, but ultimately, to set up collection schemes, we need to start looking into better sustainable packaging, but ultimately, you know, move away from these single-use, non-recyclable plastics. But one of the plastics that we find the most of on the rivers is plastic bags. You know, these are some bales coming fresh from some of our other facilities, ready to be washed, ready to be color sorted before we can actually process it. We're really looking at plastic bags as it is low value. It is 30% of what we collect here on the rivers of Bali which is insane because, you know, there is supposedly a ban on single-use plastic bags. In 2019, the governor, you know, set forward a ban on single-use plastic bags, straws, and styrofoam. And using our data, using, you know, our cleaning up data, we can really tell if the ban is set forward, if it's working, how we should be pushing for better implementation. River plastics is essentially some of the dirtiest waste out there. So then we wash it with our washing line, which is right here in order to properly you know, remove mud, sand. We wash with a natural uh, element called ecoenzyme, which is fermented peels of fruits and vegetables that we sit in sugar for about three months. And it acts like a natural soap, 
which will then you know, wash all of these plastics. We have a washing um, closed loop system in order to be able to recycle all of the water and then we bump it back up. But that's only part of the process. You know, what after? After we've cleaned the bags, we now have to sort them by color. And that is a whole other level of attention and detail. So, you know, one of the bags that we find the most of in terms of color is the red bag and zebra bags like these guys. This is, you know, a type of plastic that we see very commonly in the local traditional markets. And so after this process, we have what we call our hot press machines to be able to press plastic into sheets to then, you know, actually look into giving a second life to all of this trash that we're collecting from the rivers of the body. You know, one of the things that we realized very quickly is that river plastic, you know, there's no economical value in any of the trash that we're collecting. So, you know, once after sorting into these different types of plastics, we can never make the money back on collection. So we've had to invest in our own R&D, our own home recycling machines to be able to actually give this trash a second life. And one of the things that we can do is melt plastic down into sheets. And these sheets, you know, can be one by one meter. They can be different thicknesses depending on what we require and then eventually turn into products. Right now at Sunai Watch, we're just beginning that phase, that next phase of research. Here, we're pressing plastic bags into a sheet that will be six millimeters. So this has been, you know, through, I guess through the last year of really r and d Right now, you know, we're able to produce around 20 sheets a day. They turn out as thin as these guys. This is actually, you know, a green sheet, which is ultimately what we're doing right now. Um, but it can come out to much thicker uh, sheets. So right here, you know, this is about two centimeters of thickness. It's super heavy. Uh, and, but we can actually get up to three centimeters. So this sheet here, made from zebra bags, is a lot more sturdier and a lot heavier. This is probably 18 kilos worth of plastic bags, but you know, about 4,000 single-use plastic bags, all upcycled in here, ready to be turned into furniture or long-lasting products. So this has been you know, a long, evolving story, a long, evolving journey. You know, cleaning rivers is not all easy, but one of the things that we need is ultimate conviction and persistence. You know, the passion needs to be real, and it's so easy to look away from a problem and, you know, not think about it. What Sungai Wash has really been is, it's been our, my life journey. I'm here for the long haul, starting in Bali, but really ready to expand our project across some of Indonesia's dirtiest rivers looking really at some of the rivers as well in the Philippines very soon to really try to put an end to you know, this, this material, but ultimately making sure that it does not end up in our ocean or rivers. So we're back here in the mangroves after having taken this journey. And you know, here the mangroves are one of our most important ecosystems. Luckily enough, they're like a physical barrier, natural barrier to stop plastics before going in the ocean. If it wasn't for our mangroves, this plastic would be going right into the ocean. A piece of plastic coming out here from the river of Bali could really end up on the beach or coast in Manila as much as it could come to the coast of New York. And you know, here our work has been so intensive to try to restore these mangroves by doing physical cleanups to remove plastics that are suffocating on these roots. Um, and you know, we've been quite successful actually. Over the last year, we've cleaned up around 200 tons, 200,000 kilos worth of plastic pulling it with our hands. This is very, you know, disaster relief efforts. Cleanup are not gonna be anywhere the solution. We need to look for long-term waste management solutions properly to manage this material upstream. What we're doing here is the last job. We all use plastics and individually, we can all start saying no to plastics. It starts today with all of us. So I hope that this lecture provided you with some good learnings to implement some real change at home. Wow, amazing. Gary, I, I don't even know where to start. Um, your lecture was just so engaging and it was just not a matter of telling us, but you showed us what, you know, what's happening in Bali what is happening in the Philippines, actually, and what's most likely happening in many, many parts of the world. 
Uh, but one of my takeaways here is that you said we can either look at it and walk away or do something about it and be involved. But I got to tell you that, I mean, I don't want to walk away, but I also don't think I can get involved the way you are involved. So I hope during this lecture, we can kind of figure out a way where um, some of us who are in the middle can um, find a way to be part of this entire efforts that you are doing and Sungai Watch um, and, and, and figure out a way to be part of your, of your advocacy. So um, with us um, this afternoon, and again, you know, I want to thank Gary and the entire Sungai Watch team for sharing with us your journey in tackling one of the most challenging and prevalent issues that we are facing today, which is plastic pollution. So today's moderator, as I've mentioned earlier, we're so fortunate to have her with us this afternoon, is Cheche Lazaro, one of our Ramon Magsaysay Board of Trustees and founding president of Probe Productions, Inc., a pioneering media company in the Philippines that has produced some of the most important programs and documentaries in Philippine and Asian broadcast history. In its 30-year run, 30, as a media powerhouse, Probe has won critical acclaim here in Asia and across the globe. So ladies and gentlemen, it is my honor to now turn over our session to our moderator and panelist, the esteemed Cheche Lazaro. Thank you very much, Susan. <clears throat> that is such a uh, um, complimentary introduction. I noted uh, two things. If I, if I heard that, I'd be so intimidated by all of the data you gave. And secondly, we ran for 30 years, which is much older than Gary, our speaker today. I must say, after watching your video, Gary, um, I hate plastic myself, but it was so disgusting in one sense, and at the same time, very inspirational. So I wish to congratulate you first for being a Ramon Magsaysay laureate. It's so well-deserved, and uh, you are truly a model for, for young people and old people like myself. So to join us for this afternoon's session, uh, we have a very uh, distinguished panel. We have two uh, gentlemen who will join us. The first is our 2009 Ramon Magsaysay Awardee from the Philippines, Attorney Antonio Oposa uh, Jr., who is uh, joining us today to uh, share with us his, his reactions to your presentation. Attorney Oposa is one of Asia's leading voices in the global arena of environmental law. He is known for the Oposa Doctrine, a landmark case known worldwide where the Philippine Supreme Court held that a group of minors had a right to sue on behalf of the succeeding generations. He is credited for establishing the principles of intergenerational responsibility. Attorney Oposa founded the School of the Seas, Sea and Earth Advocates. It's a nonprofit exper uh, experiential learning center that has already trained more than 5,000 people in environmental awareness and sustainable living. Joining Attorney Oposa is James Baker from the Asian Development Bank. Uh, James is currently the Senior Circular Economy Specialist for Plastic Wastes of the Environment Thematic Group, Sustainable Development and Climate Change Department of ADB. He's responsible uh, for leading the, uh, the charge uh, in uh, reducing plastics and supporting oper oper operationalization of Strategy 2030, the Operation of Priority 3 and the Healthy Oceans Action Plan. So uh, I'd like to call first on James to please uh, tell us and share with us your reaction to the presentation of Gary. James. Thank you very much, Che Che. And uh, thank you, Gary, for your presentation. Truly inspiring. Uh, the environment has this quality that once you start working to protect it, it draws you in. It does become part of who you are. And I think that's uh, you know very valuable, very apparent in your presentation, and I think it's something we can all take inspiration from. Plastic pollution is a very tangible aspect 
of environmental damage, but it's increasingly being joined by visual and physical manifestations of global warming and other environmental changes. So as a leading, as a leading person in this, taking the battle to the environment and helping to support it is very important. Gary's story and a growing number like his are showing the power of social media for the video we've just watched, YouTube, other engagement platforms. No longer are these problems and events remote. They don't occur somewhere else in the world. They're on our screens, they're in our hands. And let us use these tools. It's very important that Gary and people like him show us these problems firsthand. It's very, very moving very impactful to see rivers suffering, to see mangroves suffering. We can't let these be swept out of sight. We can no longer ignore these problems. And Gary's work to bring that to our screens is so important. I'm truly honored today to be celebrating Gary's achievements, but also to be joined by attorney Antonio Poza as another great environmental champion. And it's champions like Gary and Tony that we need to shine a spotlight to show us what is going on in the world, to get dirty, to get rashes, to struggle against the environment, to fight for it, and to stop it disappearing from our minds. It's so easy for us to forget in our day-to-day -day lives, in our day-to-day -day business, that this is occurring everywhere. We see it. And as Gary says, it's so easy to walk past and we need champions to get dug in to remind us that we all have a responsibility. And I think the exciting thing, certainly from ADB, is that it is beginning to work. ADB and the other multinational investment banks are realigning to invest in climate, to invest in the environment. I spend my full working day working with people like Gary, large and small groups, working to defend rivers, to address plastics in the oceans, both upstream and downstream, working with markets across Asia to try and reduce these plastics, to try and control them better, manage them better, turn them into circular products and protect our environment. But it is getting late in the day. Driven by the data that people like Gary are developing, we are entering an age of responsibility personal responsibility, professional responsibility, individual and community responsibility. We can no longer rely on other people like Gary to solve these problems for us. Susan, you mentioned, how can we all get involved? Every day we all make decisions. Do we use a single use plastic cup? Do we use a reusable mug? Every one of us, everybody on this call has an opportunity to help has an opportunity to contribute. We might not be able to get rolled up as Gary has done, but we can contribute, we can work towards it with our purchasing decisions, with the messages that we send, with what we teach our children, and what we encourage our friends and peers to do. Our planet's ability to absorb the waste and damage of our civilization is already overwhelmed. We've seen that clearly in Gary's video. We cannot continue to benefit from an environment that quietly accommodates our lack of responsibility. We have to stand up. We have to work now. As Gary works, Gary's work shows us, irresponsible behavior is having increasingly immediate consequences. Flooding in Manila caused by plastic waste in our drainage systems. As we drive down our roads, as we visit our beaches, as we go to our favorite areas of the coastline, plastics are ubiquitous and we have to work to address this. By taking the lead and shining a spotlight, Gary's work is a clear example of taking responsibility, not just for his own activities, but redressing the irresponsibility of others. And we must all follow his lead and stand up and work to call out people who are not behaving, to call out people who are not taking responsibility. Collectively, taking responsibility is our only path to an environmentally sustainable future. And I thank you, Gary, for working hard for us all. Well done, and I look forward to working with you in the future. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, James, for that very insightful contribution. It is true that we are all responsible for what we do, 
and Gary has taken the lead on that. Thank you very much. May I now call on uh, Tony Opoza to share with us your insights on uh, Gary's paper. Tony? Hello. Yes. Hello, good afternoon. Good afternoon. What are your yes. insights, Tony? Please share it with us. Yes, congratulations, Gary Bichengi. Greetings of good health and spirits of happy energy. Welcome to the Ramon Magsaysay family. And hello and congratulations to the Ramon Magsaysay Foundation for your recognition and for shining the spotlight on Gary's good story. Susan Afan, Chiclet Toledo, Helen Sadol, Mom Cheche Lazaro, and hello, Mr. James Baker, and friends. Good day to you, my friends. We are here now because we are friends and friendship is defined as people of shared passions. We share a passion for the environment, also known as the life sources of land, air, and water, LAW, the law of life. Gary, uh, your title inspired me to think about what is the difference between possible and impossible. There are only two letters. I am. If I am not willing to do it, nothing is possible. If I am willing to do it, like Gary has taken the courage to do it, if he, I am willing to do it, nothing is impossible. Thank you, dear Gary Pichengib, for caring and for daring to clean the waters of life. And congratulations for your innovative solutions of upgrading it, pressing it, and turning it into a plastic one-by-one uh, -one sheet. That's very good. Uh, in, in my case, I, I have a bike shredder, and I shred the soft plastics and mix it with cement. Mr. Gary, you are a candle of hope. Uh, in the midst of darkness of today's crisis of life on Earth, you give us the light of hope, H-O-P-E, to heal our planet Earth. Mr. Gary, you are a good example of the truth that anyone at any age can make a difference. Congratulations, Gary, and thank you for your gift of human kindness. Dear friends, we would like to honor Gary our friend of shared passion. I look forward to meeting you in Manila soon. And to honor them, I have a, to honor Mr. Gary, I have will share with you a short video. And I would like to request everybody to please read it aloud. You can un unmute yourselves, I guess, so that he can hear us speaking it to him. And we speak not with our mouths, we speak not with our throats, but we will speak it from our hearts. Please play the gift of kindness. A little gift for you. Please read aloud. You will hear it and your heart may also Feel your heart. The gift of kindness makes a world of difference. A single act of kindness is greater than all the wisdom of the world put together. Kind words do not just face the goodness of others. Kind words have the power to change the destiny of the world. The seeds of goodness grow in the soil of appreciation for goodness. In every seed of kindness is the promise of a thousand forests growing in the garden of 
good. Then, 50, 100 years from now, and many generations hereafter, let it be said that in our time and during our watch, while gifted with intelligence and insight, with privilege and position, with the wealth of wisdom and with the freedom and power of the human will. Let it be said that in our time and during our watch we did our share. And maybe, just maybe, we will make a little difference. Thank you and stay happy. Thank you, Tony. That, those are very uh, powerful words and a good reminder to us that really, if we uh, did something, we can make a difference in the lives of our fellow men. Gary, I'd like to ask you to join us again and together with James and Tony to give us your uh, reactions, your, your feedback on what you just heard. Gary? Thank you. Thank, thank you so much, guys. Uh, you know, I, I thought this would be a more interactive uh, discussion. Uh, yes, and let's do it happy. now. Let's make it interactive. So please tell us how you feel. No, no, definitely very humbled um, by, by, by your beautiful, uh, both, you know, your very kind words about our work. Um, you know, I think that, uh, James, you, you, you said it very clearly, you know, we, we are uh, destructing our planet almost quicker than we can restore it. And, you know, this is um, quite scary to, to, to experience. Um, I'm just curious, you know, uh, from uh, both of your perspective, you know, how far are we actually at that level of, you know, have we, have we turned the point of no return? Um, you know, like, yes, it's great to be hopeful, but um, at the same time, you know, um, we have, yeah, just, just curious to, to hear from, from both of you. James, are we... Uh, at the point of no return in the destruction of our Earth? Uh, I really hope not, Che Che, um, you know, for all of our sakes and the sake of our children. Um, Fifteen years ago, I was working in the climate change industry um, for the Kyoto Protocol on carbon. Um, we were focusing our, fully on mitigation, and it never occurred to us that we wouldn't succeed. Um, now, 15 years later, we're focusing heavily on adaption because we did fail. You know, we have not managed to control the climate change that we're experiencing. You know, we're focusing on mitigation. We're seeing countries dealing with rising tides. We're dealing with we're seeing countries dealing with increasingly bad environmental events, freak weather events, and they're becoming less freak. They're becoming more regularized. And the work that we see Gary doing with the plastics is, is a very tangible example. When we first started talking about climate change, it was easy to deny. It was easy for people to ignore. When you have a river full of plastics, when you have social media, videos, cameras, showing this damage, people taking photos on holiday. I mean, you remember 15, 10, 15 years ago, we didn't have cameras on phones. This was something you told people about, but now you can see it. It becomes much more apparent. I think the reality of it is, is we are very close to a point of no return on certain aspects of our environment. And that's why I say, said in my response to Gary's video, we, we have to act now. We are act, entering an age of responsibility. It's no longer something that can be pushed to other people. It's no longer something that um, happens somewhere else. In Europe this summer, there were massive droughts. In India, 
there was a heat wave a few years ago in Australia, there were wildfires. In America, they're experiencing flooding, they're experiencing typhoons. These weather events, these climate events are tangible, they're on our doorsteps. Um, working with plastics working is, is a key aspect of this. It's part of a much bigger picture, but the overall recognition that we are approaching tipping points, we are approaching positions where we will not be able to recover or not recover easily and comfortably. Um, that realization and recognition is a key and part, a key and important part of the work that I do, the work that Gary's doing, the work that everybody who is fighting to protect our environment, to solve these problems is trying to achieve. So I hope for all our sakes, we've not passed the point of no return, but we would be, uh, we would be remiss if we didn't recognize that we are close. Thank you. Uh, Tony, do you think we are uh, past the point of no return? Uh, good question and uh, good insights, James. Um, when I read the facts, when I read the science, I cannot help but feel hopeless. But when I see what good people, when I hear the good stories of what good people like Gary is doing, I cannot help but be hopeful. That is the basis for the, uh, the a new movement that has been started called the Good Stories Movement. That instead of looking at the wrong, as a lawyer, uh, I have always been looking to fight to right the wrong. Now we will search for stories of the good, the right, and the strong. And the story of Gary is one such wonderful story. Mm -hmm. Gary, you mentioned earlier in your talk that uh, the you see rays of hope because there are some communities where you have removed the barriers because the plastics are no longer there. Do you find that this is a good indicator for you to see that you're successful and that maybe you are beginning to reverse the tide? Yes, I think definitely so. I think, you know, when you let nature rest, um, nature is so resilient. You know, when you don't trash river anymore and public awareness has risen, I think that, you know, we can change, still change things around. Um, when we clean a mangrove forest, you know, and let it, let it take out all of the plastics that is suffocating on, on its roots and see it come back to life after six months, eight months. And, you know, so I, th I think that, that it's just, I think, more of a human behavioral problem. Um, you know, na nature will, will, will thrive on its own. It's just the, the, how fast we're destruct destructing it. But I, I'm hopeful that, you know, now more than ever, I think, you know, with things like social media, um, you know, we are a lot more aware. Public, general public awareness globally is there. Um, it may be more, you know, of a gap in, uh, for example, in the global south here in Indonesia, for some people that do not yet have access to social media, how are they, um, you know, how, how should we cater to them so that, you know, everybody is well informed on this problem. In Indonesia, you know, about, there's a new study that, that, that came out that 70% of Indonesians don't know that plastic is bad. And so I think, you know, this is almost one of the biggest battles is that people use it, but don't necessarily know the impacts that it has on our marine life, but also our health. So that's the transition that we need to, to push for. Mm -hmm. Is that a uh, is that an overly optimistic view of uh, what you're doing, or is this a realistic assessment of the success rate of your program? Um, no, I think with with the, with the right scale, um, I think you know we right now I think the next two three years are going to be really hard disaster relief effort, um, you know, to try to put plastic pollution even more front and center than ever has been. You know, plastics in the environmental sector, uh, climate, the climate change uh, battle is that one battle that we can, I feel, still win within our lifetime, you know, within the next 20 years, within the next 30 years, because it's something that we all use, you know, we're so connected to it. Um, you know, if, you, if everybody on this call was to look into their fridge, 
you know, I guarantee that everybody would have plastics there if you look, start looking into your house. And so if we start saying no to it individually, um, you know, that's where we can really think, um, change things around. Yes. Okay. Any other comments that uh, you'd like to make, Tony and James? I, I think um, what Gary was saying about the, the world being able to regenerate is very true. We saw this during COVID-19. Whilst a lot of us were focusing on uh, survival and dealing with our own personal challenges, the world regenerated without us involved with it. We saw clearer skies here in Manila. We saw nature recovering. We saw animals reproducing in zoos without, the, without people there to annoy them. So the world is capable of recovering. The world is capable of regenerating. And uh, very early on in my career, um, a, a senior manager told me that we don't have to protect the planet. We have to protect the human race because the planet will protect itself by effectively removing us from the equation. And that is where we have to start looking is how we can work together to protect ourselves, to minimize our impact on the planet, to reduce our resource requirement, and to help us to help the planet begin to regenerate. And I think Gary's points about human nature are very important. It is difficult if your challenge is day-to-day -to -day survival to worry about the environment, but ultimately long-term survival for everybody will be related to the survival of the planet. So I think it is it is work we have to do over the next few years. There will be some very painful experiences, but we're all working to change as fast as we can to reduce those difficult decisions, to reduce those challenges and move towards a beneficial outcome for everybody. Thank you. Uh, that's a very interesting point that you bring out, James, because if, the, if uh, everybody is working just to survive, and there are many parts of this globe where survival is a major issue. How can we refocus that desire, that need to survive into preserving the planet? It's, as of now, it's still far removed from the person who's trying to survive on a daily basis, to care about the planet. Do you find that that is true or not? Certainly, it's it's an educational issue. It's to work together to support all parts of the community, to support every member of our global community, so that we can focus on these challenges. Um, if people are worrying about where the food is coming from their family, then they're less concerned about the immediate actions of the, where the plastic is going. But I mean, Gary's work on the ground in the community working with the community is a clear demonstration that that can work. You know, Gary is working with people who spend their lives surviving day to day on two or three dollars a day, but his project, his hard work has engendered that buy-in, has engendered that responsibility, I think is a clear example that it is possible. Okay, I, I also want to ask uh, Tony about, you have the School of the Seas, and you have educated over 5,000 uh, warriors to help preserve the environment. Have you seen that uh, people are able to shift their attention from uh, survival to caring about the planet? Uh, yes. Uh, education mainly. Education and not just talking and talking, but what I do is I make them actually do it. For example, food. We teach children how to plant vegetables and how to grow vegetables and how to harvest, and then they harvest. So there's your solution to food. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I was reminded by a line from James Baker, says, in the eyes of nature, humans are just another species in trouble. And whether or not we will be eliminated, we will commit self-inflicted harakiri, ecological harakiri. Maybe the earth will be better off without humans, but then there are humans who truly care. A good example is Gary. 
and um, really doing something, do, do, doing their share to care. Uh huh. Gary, what do you think? Yeah, I mean, I, I guess, uh, you, you know, um, this is going to require, you know, that, that, that's one of the reasons why we're so focused on, on data, um, you know, to speak to the people that can sort of be, you know, who can we point fingers to? Where, where does this plastics come from? Is it, is it, you know, if every single corporate, you know, packager was moving away from single-use plastics and looking at more sustainable packaging, would we be in a, in a better in a better situation? Um, you know, is it governments that aren't pushing regulations, enough regulations, or, you know, in Indonesia, for example, for example, we don't have a standard as to what packagers can use in their plastics. So you don't have a standardized system like, you know, you have in the EU. Um, and that's what makes the, 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 the industry, you know, quite complicated. Everybody can just use whatever type of plastic, even if it's not unrecyclable and continue to produce it. Um, you know, in the next uh, decade, we set to triple our plastic production, and that is very scary. Um, and so that's where we're going to need, you know, multi um, cross collaborations, you know, on all levels, not just individuals, not just communities, but ultimately, you know, governments really to step in. Um, you know, there's a global plastic treaty that, that is currently uh, being, um, you know, put together, and hopefully it'll, it'll be signed uh, by 2023 to really push re governments to regulate, you know, bans on single use plastics, but ultimately move away from from this material. That's very alarming. If it will triple in the next decade, um, you can't move. You can't move your your advocacy forward as fast as three times. Or can you? That 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 is why uh, you know the, the, this idea of, of no return, seeing where we are. Um, you know, definitely when we went down the the most polluted river in the world, the Chitaram. Uh, back in 2017, and it is not anymore the, the most polluted river in the world. But you know that that was sort of seeing stepping into a whole other world. Um, you know, we never anticipated ever how far we we come to the destruction of our planet. You know, it almost is an apocalyptic ap apocalyptic movie. Um, you know, where we're stepping on another planet, but this is really our planet. You know, and unfortunately, that is really just one river. There's other rivers bleeding in the same way. Um, and, you know, more production ultimately means, you know, less management uh, every single minute, you know, one garbage truck full of plastic pollution enters our ocean and that, you know, is set to increase as, so I think it's, we have to change the entire system and it needs to be global systematic change. Um, and that's why, you know, potentially projects like ours, but many other projects need to scale um, throughout the region, throughout Asia. Okay, so the, the key word here is to scale up that project and make it available in all parts of Asia. Uh, James, from your point of view, from ADB, when you were refocusing your, your, um, your help around the world, uh, where is the focus? Is it, is it in Asia? Where are the, where did you, where, where are the critical areas? So... As ADB, obviously, we, we focus on Asia, but as Gary said, it, data is key for us. Um, you know, what, what can get measured can get changed. So we are increasingly being data-driven. Um, we're collecting information from projects like Gary's, from larger projects and initiatives across Asia, and starting to use that data to then instruct investment, but also to begin to develop the returns of that investment so it's attractive for governments, for communities. And as Gary's mentioned, you know, a lot of the plastics that are currently in the environment have very little value. They're very difficult to recycle. And those difficult plastics are the ones that we have to work on a source activity to prevent them entering the supply chain, to prevent them entering the value chains. Some of the plastics we use are very recyclable. And if we can manage them effectively, then they are they continue to add value to our activities, our, you know, our consumption patterns. But the reality of it is, is we are still using plastics that are unrecyclable. And that is where we're beginning to look more and more working with investors, working with funding sources so that we can influence global brands 
so that we can work with the major fast moving consumer goods producers to avoid these plastics and to find solutions and alternatives. One of the biggest challenges we have, as Gary mentioned in his video of the sachets, if we can avoid sachets, then that is a fantastic benefit for the environment, but making sure that those products, the health products, the hygiene products are still available in those quantities in an accessible form at the correct price point is the challenge. And this is where we're getting into the the movement from our current economy, our linear economy, to a circular economy, where there are these unpleasant trade-offs. As we start to value the environment, that is reducing the economic value for a lot of these companies. So it becomes a shareholder decision. It becomes an investor decision. And as I mentioned, uh, when Susan said we, we, we struggle with our ability individually to contribute, and Gary reiterated this, that we all have purchasing decisions. Every day we go to supermarkets, we buy products. Every day we go to coffee shops, we buy products. If each one of us makes that decision not to purchase or to purchase a sustainable alternative, then the message will be transferred up into the supply chain, up to these product suppliers. And that is the very important part of this. And that is why everybody has a responsibility. Mm -hmm. Everybody in every decision they make has a responsibility to help address these challenges. Uh -huh. And where should the pressure be put? Uh, because you were talking about a return on investment for businessmen, that if they, if they move towards helping the environment, it will mean less business for them. Uh, so where... Is ADB is ADB uh, exerting any pressure on certain groups to help the environment? So we we work across supply chains, we work across communities and across across business sectors to promote sustainable decisions, to promote climate sensitive and climate smart investment decisions. Our alignment with the uh, Paris Agreement now means that every activity within ADBs remit has to ha has to comply with the Paris Agreement for climate change. And similarly, our circular economy activities related to plastics and to related to a lot of other goods are increasing. We are looking for those opportunities to invest. We're looking for those opportunities to influence policies at government level, at regional level, to level the playing field, to allow companies that want to do better to maintain their competitive advantage so that they are not disadvantaged by sustainability. And that is the approach we're taken. It's it's the, the carrot as opposed to the stick. Other people are taking the stick approach, but certainly at ADB, we're working to level playing fields to support businesses as they make these decisions, as they make these sustainability changes, and to support communities as they adopt more sustainable behaviors. And we are finding more success with that. Thank you. That's very insightful. Gary, you have anything else to add? Or Tony, anything else to add before we close this discussion? Yeah, nothing much. But okay. uh, I, I enjoy the insights that they have uh, shared with us. And yes, it all boils down to how we behave ourselves. If we continue to buy and not even bring our eco bags, then we will use all the plastics. Um, in my case, I, I keep all those plastic containers and then I put, I use them for planting veg small vegetables. Ah, uh, that's a good idea. Uh, so I will invite, I've been inviting Susan and you uh, to this garden by the sea where we have a zero waste practice. And Gary, when you come, when you come at the end of the month, I will bring you there because I will show you the bike shredder that we invented. Small plastics are shredded and then they're mixed into cement as a part of part of the cement. So uh -huh. solutions are simple. It makes the cement a, a stronger binding um, material. Yeah, well, it really it's additional. It's additional. Uh, it's additional aggregates instead of so much sand. 
But ah. I like the idea of what um, I have friends, uh, Gary, I will introduce them to you when you come. I have friends, for example, that melt plastic and then turn them into uh, uh, school school seats, seats for school children. Oh. It's been done already. I'll show you, I'll introduce them to you. I'll show you how they do it Good. here in the Philippines. So Gary, you now have a full schedule. When you get here, you'll have to see <laughs> you'll have to see Bantayan Island, then you'll have to see oh. any of the ideas here. Uh, not in Bantayan anymore. Not in, not Bantayan. in Bantayan. I have, I have, I have moved. I have transplanted the idea of the school of the sea and the sea camp. I have transplanted here to Anilao. We have a new place. Oh, it's only two hours away. oh yeah. easier. That's more yeah, that's much easier, point. and we have a new. Uh, we have a place called Garden by the Sea. Okay. And uh, with the practice of uh, practice of zero waste, all organic material is turned into compost. All inorganic material are either upcycled, recycled, and reused. Wonderful. So there can be an exchange. Gary, can we have the last word from you before we close this session? I think, you know, um, this was very, very well said, but, you know, I think the, the, the emergency is here. Um, you know, we know how quickly we, we are destroying our planets. And I think that, you know, um, everybody here has a, a role to play. Um, you know, we can look at ourselves in the mirror, but look at our consumption habits, you know, in the mirror. Really analyze our plastic usage to try to, to ultimately stop it. Um, you know, I would strongly recommend everybody in this room um, you know, to potentially join a river cleanup, which is quite different to, you know, if you've done a coastal cleanup, a beach cleanup, um, river cleanups are very physical. And I think one of the, the biggest fundamental aspects of why we are right now, you know, is because we've, we've ultimately lost our connection to nature. And if we are to get back and understand and see it from our eyes, um, you know, and, and be in the rivers, um, you know, I think we'll, we'll all get to understand it a little different. Seeing a, a post on social media is already that first step, right? We see we're attracted by shocking visuals, but experiencing with our boots in the water, um, you know, will get us to really change that perspective. So um, we're excited to, you know, to, to be expanding hopefully very soon to the Philippines. Um, if you guys are in, the, in Indonesia, um, you know, we have cleanups every day. Um, yeah. But yeah, hopefully soon, you know, you could come in a river near you uh, where we can fight this global war on plastics. Okay, thank you for that uh, for that rah rah rallying for us. And uh, now, before we go to our audience to invite our audience to join us, also let's do a photo of this group. Um, are we ready for the photo op? Before we proceed to the question and answer portion, we would like to request our panel for a photo opportunity. Okay. Joining us in this photo op is our awardee Gary and our panelists. So please may we request for the panelists to turn on your cameras and give us your best smiles. We are taking a screenshot in three, two, one. Okay, and another one, please. Three, two, one. All right, thank you very much. And back to you, Ms. Cheche. Thank you, Helen. May I now call on my co-moderator today, Chicla Toledo, uh, to help me, or to help us facilitate the question and answer from our virtual participants. We have quite a few. And if you have questions or comments, please join us. Thank you, Ms. Cheche. Thank you. Yes. We now proceed to the open forum. Welcome fellow workers in the development sector and friends from the academe, support, supporters from the different international NGOs and all of you who share this strong concern about the use of plastics protecting our rivers and the environment. We have listened to Gary and to our esteemed panelists and we have seen how passionate and unwavering their commitments are to their chosen purpose, which is always for the common good, defying existing conventions and even offering alternative visions of social solidarity. We are happy that we have a diverse set of participants and we're getting already a lot of questions now coming in uh, via the Zoom uh, chat box and Q&A. 
And uh, we are all connected no, through this common mission of creating sustainable imprints in this home we call our earth. Let us begin our conversation. Your questions can be directed to Gary, to James, or to Attorney Oposa, or just uh, share your insight, your, your uh, reaction, anything that hit you while you were listening to, to our panelists. Uh, and you can raise your hand, you can ask your questions live, or put it in the chat box. Okay, we want to hear more of the young, uh, the young, young, the youth sector. We have a lot of uh, students from different universities, Gary, uh, listening to you. Uh, okay, so maybe I'll take the question now uh, from the chat box. Uh, there are actually two connected questions and uh, the question uh, is coming from Steven and there's another one, Steven Mansi. Welcome Steven, Steven is our Say, say OID from last year, and he's doing a lot of work with uh, uh, refugees no? and, uh, in, in the southern part of, of the Philippines and, and in Southeast Asia. It's really how you have uh, engaged communities to join you in your, in your work. Are they volunteers? Are they from the government? How did you raise their awareness? Did you uh, encounter any pushback? from government corporations and how you have addressed it. So it's really how you, you know, put that awareness in the plate of communities, uh, especially in the early days of your work. Yeah, um, thank you, Stephen. Great to connect here and uh, with a fellow awardee. Um, you know, I think community work is so crucial in this battle, um, you know, against plastic pollution, but this environmental battle, battle more specifically, um, here in Bali, you know, 90% uh, of the population is Hindu and, you know, very religious. I mentioned this concept of Trihita Karana, which is the harmony between gods, humans, and nature. Um, and, you know, uh, using high priests basically is a great way of going about, you know, uh, pitching to the crowd, you know, really putting these concepts out there. So we've always taken it from a more cultural perspective. Now that we are expanding our work throughout Java, which is you know, a lot more Islamic based, uh, we're working with imams. So I think really tapping into cultural uh, groups, but ultimately, you know, in any, any type of groups out there, making it cool to clean up. Um, you know, I think back when we started 14 years ago, plastic pollution was not at all front page. It was actually you know, quite nerdy to go out and clean, clean, clean up a, a beach. Now it's cool, it's uh, you know, almost sexy and trendy. People wanna get selfies on the beach with us or on the rivers. Um, so I think that, you know, cleaning up is, um, that's, that's how we, we've managed to, to make it such a communal um, perspective. I think back to your question on, on governments, um, you know, we have, we've built this movement, um, this foundation fully from the grassroots up. Um, and, you know, oftentimes, especially here in Bali, can be quite tricky with, you know, in every village, you have a cultural leader and an administrative leader. And sometimes they're in war against each other. Um, so sometimes, you know, when coming into asking for permits, every single barrier that we, we, we place, we have to get proper permits with the government, you know, introdu introduction of our project. Right now we're in about, you know, 35 different villages across Bali. Um, and so, you know, playing with different local egos can be quite tricky, uh, making sure, you know, that we don't overstep anybody you know, even if we've met the president of Indonesia and we're very uh, close with different ministries, you know, staying humble to the cause and making sure that from every level up, everybody's informed, everybody's a part of it. Um, and so I think that that's been one of the, the, the more com biggest complications of, you know, having to speak the political language to make sure that everybody's on the same page. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You've actually navigated your way around the, this uh, egos that you're talking about no, creatively. And, and uh, I guess that's the concern no, of a lot of those uh, in the audience who are listening to you because there's interest, there's awareness, and yet there's resistance when you ask them to begin to do the hard work. No? And, and uh, I think you've used a lot of uh, even a cultural, religious, spiritual aspect of, of the community's side. No? And there's a question from actually related to that, Gary, is the question of, uh, of uh, Father Joseph of Radio Veritas. No? And he likened you to a good Samaritan. Uh, 
Uh, I don't know if Father Joseph is here and he can come uh, online. Father Joseph, would you want to, to ask your question personally, if that's possible? No, you cannot open. Okay. So, well, his question really is you are, you are cleaning up, no, 200 tons, is it? That question, let me see. 200 tons or several thousands of tons be, you, you clean up and you've removed, but the ecological bandits are still there and they are in high places. So the question is how really to, to stop production and use of plastics. I think that's the question that's always coming to our mind. And, and I think James would be able to help us understand the, is there a way for individuals like us, like Father Joseph, how can we stop the bandit? The bandits, okay. You, yeah, I'll, I'll take that one first and then uh, hand it over to James. But I think, yeah, with, with our work, it's really been, you know, more about um, accumulating data, right? Data speaks in a million words. You know, you can't look away from data when it's real. Um, at the moment at Sungai Watch over the last two years, we've collected 700,000 tons, uh, sorry, 700,000 kilos. Um, and, you know, yearly in Indonesia, um, you know, Indonesia, um, there's about 200,000 tons to 550,000 tons of plastics entering our ocean every year. So if you look at our impact over the last two years, we've solved 0.001% of the total plastic pandemic in Indonesia, which is nothing. But you know the, the work that we've done on a community perspective. When you see a river and you see you know that in two years you can take it off because there's no more plastics inside of it, um, I think that that is quite um, amazing. And if we can scale that to a thousand rivers, you know, and if we can really look at ways of, of scaling that up, then we can make massive um, impact individually. Um, you know, I think every consumer has. A, a choice, you know, we, we mentioned that before uh, with James and responsibility, and it starts there. It starts by, you know, as an individual, not purchasing single-use plastics, moving away from it. And, you know, if we can do that collectively, if we can do that, you know, millions of people not buying plastics anymore, it'll definitely have a voice and producers will ultimately want to move away from it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We, we manage our the consumers, no? the demand. That's where we, we can begin to contribute so that single-use plastic is avoided. If uh, James would like to chime in anytime, please uh, just open your camera and, and uh, uh, yeah, share I, I think, your, yeah. Your, yeah. Go ahead. I, I, th I, think, I think I'm on. But uh, yeah, in the, the, the question about um, what, what Father Joseph refers to as bandits, but we, we refer to more internationally as waste crime. I what think what white waste, waste crime. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, it is it is a cultural change, it is a generational change. Mm -hmm. Um, what we're looking for here is a wider except you know, a, 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 a wider stance that this is no longer acceptable. Um, you know, if we all as as Gary said, that you know, we can all throw our hands up and say this is too big a problem. You know, this will not, you know, I, I can't do anything about this. One step is your, your purchasing decisions. Every purchasing decision is a vote. Essentially, if you stop buying single-use plastics or if you find alternatives, then that is a vote. But when it comes to this challenge of, of generational activities, um, you know, what we learn in schools now, you know, what our children learn in schools, they will take forward with them. We are still dealing to some extent with a legacy of, of previous bad behavior, of learned behavior, of what is acceptable. Um, as recognition of these challenges, of these problems grows, as awareness grows, as more videos circulate, as more people like Gary stand up, as more people like attorney opposers stand up, then the people who are behaving badly, who aren't taking responsibility, for their role in the global community will become under increasing pressure. We are not going to be able to solve these overnight. Mm -hmm. That is just a, a cultural problem. Um, you know, and there are cultural solutions, but unfortunately, they are more generational. 
Mm -hmm. You know, Gary is working very well with religious leaders and using that as an access point. One of the ways that we have of, of working with schools, with mothers, with women in the community to help them influence how their households behave working with children, educating them so that they see that these behaviors are not the best way forward, giving them reasonable alternatives. It's all building that groundswell of knowledge, that groundswell of recognition, of standing up, of saying this is not acceptable. Mm -hmm. And eventually, if we are successful, that will slowly reduce the occurrences of this waste crime, of these bandits, of this problem of open dumping, of fly tipping. The challenge we have is the speed of that change. Um, you know, as we said earlier in this lecture, and as Gary's highlighted, we, we are down in two months, years, mm. not decades, before these problems manifest themselves and cause you know, irreparable damage. And this is the challenge that, that, that we all face as a global community is how quickly we can change. Um, unfortunately, or well, fortunately, we're all working ourselves to make this better. Unfortunately, the global climate is providing us a very good example of why we need to change. As we tune into our TVs, as we go onto social media and see wildfires, floods, droughts, you know, it is an inescapable fact that the world is changing. And hopefully this will motivate more and more of us to change more quickly. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, it's very it's an intimidating problem, but it has to have to start somewhere and it can start with from us, no, individually. Thank you so yeah. much. We have a, a, a participant no, who wants to ask a, a question. Celine, Celine, please. Um, hello. Yes, go ahead. Uh, my name my name is Celine, and I'm a student here in uh, architecture school in Denmark. Uh, I would hello just there. like to um, thank you all for a very interesting uh, seminar. And uh, I have a question to Gary specifically. Um, so after hearing about how data is very vital and uh, that you collect data regarding the plastic waste. I was just wondering if there are any data regarding the natural waste that is uh, surrounding us in our everyday lives as well. Uh, leaves, coconut shells, and logs that could possibly uh, replace plastic from the first step. Are there any invasive data collection regarding to how much of the natural waste that is uh, accessible today? And if that is the potential to replace plastic from scratch one. Yeah. Thank you, Celine. Um, I guess, um, you know, we, when we started the project, um, we started to divide right on the river organic to, to plastic waste. Um, and so, you know, we're collecting all sorts of data on what we were collecting. Um, in the, in, very quickly, we, we got overwhelmed with our plastic waste collections and um, you know, realized that sometimes organic waste you know, should live their own uh, natural life. Um, you know, they, from thousands of years, when rivers have first been um, you know, in existence, um, rivers were basically bringing you know, high materials from high mountains all the way to the ocean. And it's sort of a natural process to do that. Um, I think when, when you're speaking about you know, sustainable packaging, that could replace plastic. There, there are more and more startups that are looking at seaweed as one of the best ways of, of the, you know, in terms of the characteristics of it. And so you have very startups um, in Indonesia that we work with who have um, that type of data. Um, and so, um, yeah, definitely could um, put you in touch or uh, type it in the comments as to other people working in that space. Yeah, there's a, an offer to help you, Gary, from Catherine. Catherine just caught uh, doing a, an eco brand in Bali also, and we would, would probably get in touch with you. And uh, some other groups from the South Borneo. Uh, and, and the question is, is fundraising a problem with getting more uh, to support your work? 
especially if you are calling out some of the corporations who are you know, producing the plastic. Yes, um, I guess I guess we've never set uh, you know to accept money from uh, packagers or or uh, the people that were up against. Although you know this is not, not a battle, we want to make sure that there's conversation on on both sides. Um, we work with you know a lot of sustainable companies that have similar ethics than we do. Um, you know that, that have, have full move, fully moved away from plastic pollution in their production lines, um, and that just believe in the work that we do. We're very reliant on donations. Um, through our website, um, you know, amazing, generous people that just want to that, that would just want to help. And I think that you know, in the midst of COVID, uh, when Bali was closed down, which is when really Sungai Watch really started, uh, one of the silver linings is that people started to look at the island of gods as a way of you know giving back. So it's been very community oriented. You know, local businesses wanting to be part of it. Now that we're scaling up, other you know, outside of Bali, uh, we definitely need. Um, you know, a lot more funds to be able to scale, but we're really looking into, um, you know, different financial models, uh, you know, blended finance, looking to tap, tapping into municipal funding, um, as well as, you know, various levels of sponsorships. Um, and that's the reason why we are starting our social enterprise. Um, so the production line of, of products uh, made from river plastic in order to then have, be an offsetter, have an offsetter that buys plastics from, so low valuable plastics that we're collecting from the river and ultimately, you know, fund back cleanup. And if we can do that well, um, you know, it can be an economical model that can allow the scale up of, you know, Sungai Watch amongst many islands, many rivers. Um, you know, it's really just setting up the proper systems in place to be, to have the off takers. One of the biggest problems of the space is that it's so hard to, you know, once you've collected the plastic, you've sorted it, you've treated it, what's next? And so that's why, you know, we, we felt that we needed also to be in the space of um, turning plastics into a secondary resource. Yeah, yeah. I, I think there's a related question to that, Gary. When you try to clean up the plastic waste, how long does it usually take? And then when, do you melt it? You know, there's some technical questions here. Uh, maybe quickly you can just uh, uh, tell the audience, uh, how how is it when you collect all the plastics and then you melt it, you sort it, et cetera. Yes, yeah, so the, the first thing straight off from the river is, is sorting it. Um, you know, on the river, um, we're really just sorting between organic and non-organic waste. So that goes through one of our sorting stations, which is basically a very simple, you know, stainless steel table. Uh, and manually, we, we, we sort. Um, and yeah, there it's, you know, 20 different types of, of waste, aluminum, glass, metals, um, different types of plastics. And then it goes through a secondary system, uh, sorting, you know, to actually pinpoint different things, different differences. You know, when you have some plastic packaging in Indonesia have different types of plastics within it. Um, and so, uh, you know, it has to go through a secondary step, but ultimately, um, you know, whatever can be recycled, we sell back to aggregators that um, can recycle it. So things like, you know, HDPE, uh, hard plastics or PET plastic bottles, um, you know, there are systems in place here to actually recycle those. But speaking about more low value plastics, like the plastic bags, which is about 30% of what we collect. Um, and so that, you know, we're really focused on giving that a second life and creating our own schemes in order to properly upcycle that. Um, mm -hmm. And so, uh, you know, the hot press that you saw in the video is really to turn plastics into sheets. Uh, we don't burn plastic, we melt it down at a very low temperature for a long time. Mm -hmm. We have some exhausts um, on the hot presses to be able to filter out any off gassing um, but ultimately, you know, the team working has uh, gas masks to make sure that, that, that we're safe when in an open area. It's not a perfect solution. Um, you know, we're learning every single day, trying to upcycle um, as much as possible. When we started, you know, it was purely just from a perspective of, of passion. Let's clean up a river. But then very quickly, you know, the, the bigger question came, what, what do we actually do with it? And how can we actually recycle it for good? So there's so much learnings as we go with it, but that's why we work with toxicologists, you know, material scientists, um, engineers to really have systems in place where we'll not just be moving one problem and creating yet another. Like we really have to, you know, for anybody out there that may be an architect, an engineer, a designer, that's where we need everybody on board, um, you know, looking for ultimately, you know, the, our dream scenario is to be put out of business. Like if we can take out all of our barriers and have 
you know, not have Sungai Watch anymore. I think we've done our job. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, that's what we're trying to do village by village, river by river. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It's really a multi-sectoral thing, no? It cannot just be Sungai Watch. It cannot just be Gary, yeah. yeah. And you, you have uh, generated a solid traction for people to support you now. Uh, so there is a question from uh, Alfian Shah from uh, Yogyakarta, Indonesia. Shall I read your question, or would you want to uh, come on board and and answer and uh, raise your question yourself, Alfian? Okay, Alfian is not coming on board, but let me read the question, Gary. Thank you so much for what you have done with your wonderful team protecting the river in our country. And I know it takes time, she said. Would you like to share to us the challenges or difficulties along the way? And what is actually the best of your work so far? I mean, what, maybe the, something that you feel very happy about so far. Yeah, you know, I guess one of the, the biggest challenges is, you know, the fact that, you know, you clean a river fully and then, you know, the next day or a couple of days later, it gets trashed again and it feels like, you know, you completely defeated, uh, you're far away from the problem. I think it's really waking up knowing that there'll probably even be potentially more plastics in, um, in the rivers or, you know, there'll be more rivers with more plastics in it. And I think it's just keeping that persistence alive um, you know, this problem is is definitely a big one. And, um, you know, I mentioned that, you know, we, it, sometimes it feels like we're destructing our planet quicker than we can actually um, restore it. So how, I think that's the biggest challenge, you know, the emotional challenge of keep on going. Um, but that's why, you know, at Sungai Watch, we try to celebrate every single wins and focus on, you know, micro wins. I think it's important to celebrate, mm -hmm. to keep the team happy, to keep the team engaged. Uh, you know, we now employ um, 120 people full time on the island, and you know they're cleaning rivers, they're sorting the material, they're working in our facilities, and um, so whenever we can, you know, whenever we have a big cleanup and we've been successful at it, um, or you know whether we find a new solution of what to do with the bags, or on a research perspective, um, it's really important to, to sit down, reflect, and uh, let a celebration um, play out. Um, I guess so that. Uh, you know, to that point, um, one of the things that we're the most proud about is, uh, you know, seeing the removal of some of our barriers already in two years of work in three of the villages that we started working in, um, to see the mindset change uh, happen, you know, the awareness increasing, but ultimately, you know, the river actually being cleaned up um, and not anymore having plastic inside of it. So I think that's definitely, um, you know, the thing that we're the most proud of but we can't wait to hopefully, you know, replicate in as many rivers as possible. Mm -hmm. Thank you. There's a question here that uh, when you come to Manila, Gary, please do not be shocked that we still use a lot of plastic bags in whether we, we buy our food, you know, supermarket and in the malls. Uh, what is it? What is it that you will tell to us? Filipinos about the uh, use of plastic and we will show you around no, some of the uh, rivers in, in Metro Manila where you will see some uh, polluted rivers but when you come to Manila what will you tell us Filipinos? I think um, I have to be there first to tell you anything I don't want to <laughs> yes, judge of anything course. first <laughs> uh, you know Indonesia Bali is far from perfect um, we cannot wait to, to be there already in two weeks and I think to absorb as much as possible um, to see, you know, how can this be an uh, interchangeable experience? You know, how can we be inspired by you guys? How can we maybe, you know, tell you a little bit about our work and let that be inspiration for, for, for how to solve and clean rivers in Manila. But we're very, very excited to, you know, to have uh, this trip ahead, to have this amazing honor of being an awardee with the Maxese. Uh, foundation and really to use this opportunity to keep on fighting this fight because you know Indonesia needs it, the Philippines needs it, uh, many other countries need proper solutions. Definitely. Miss Susan, please join us and Miss Cheche. When we welcome Gary, we should 
ensure that we don't have any plastic on hand. <laughs> he might call us out. <laughs> Ms. Susan, any last uh, words before we move to our synthesis? No, um, you know, Gary, you really represent the best of the youth, uh, <laughs> not just in Asia, but in the world. It's people like you that we really need to, to support more because you have that energy, that commitment, that hopeful drive to do good in this world. And that's what keeps us all hopeful. So may your tribe increase. And we are so uh, excited to see you in Manila. Yeah. Okay. Let's, re let's replicate Gary. <laughs> I just said, Gary one, we're gonna Gary clone two, you. Gary we're gonna clone you, Gary. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you so much to all the uh, participants who raised their questions. And, you know, it, this will not end in this webinar. You have our social media uh, uh, accounts. And please do connect to us via our Facebook, our Instagram, our website. And, and just uh, tell to us any more questions that you want Gary and the other awardees to answer. So with that, we close our open forum. And I now turn the floor to Ms. Cheche. That was a most interesting uh, series of questions and feedback to, to Gary. As I said earlier, let's replicate you. And the more Garys we have, I think we'll have a better world. You know, this whole thing began with the crazy idea of our young uh, Magsaysay laureate here with us this afternoon, Gary, at age 14, together with his brother and sister, and together with schoolmates, he decided to clean up the beach, one beach at a time. Over the years, they came to realize that just cleaning up did not address the real problem. 80 to 90% of plastic pollution comes from land-based sources. And they felt that if change is to happen, rivers are the connection, as he pointed out several times, between life on the land and life in the ocean and the ocean. Uh, as a group, they wanted to get the problem to the front pages and to the top of mind of people. So in 2017, Gary and his uh, siblings went on a two-week paddling cruise down the Sitarum River. The cruise uh, revealed what Gary calls the worst in humanity, mountains of trash burning, foul smell, and clogged waterways that block the way. In fact, he did say in his video that, um, or in his paper, that there was a time they had to lift their, their plastic bankas out of the river to avoid, because there was no more water to transport them and move it to cleaner areas. They decided to use media to communicate what they saw. And as young people, they produced a video series that went viral, uh, rightfully so. And they realized that these powerful images, similar to the images that we saw this afternoon, convey the urgency of the problem. I mean, when you swim in a river of plastic trash, it's not fun swimming at all. It proves it proved to them that anyone can portray messages of change like they did. They caught the attention of the authorities. President Jokowi of Indonesia and the Minister of the Environment launched a seven-year program, Sitarum Harun, a cleanup deploying over 7,000 military troops. But the, the battle for them was really far from over. Every minute, a garbage truck full of plastic pollution enters the ocean. Every minute, can you imagine that? Since 2017, plastic pollution has increased. In 2018, single use was named word of the year by Collins Dictionary. The ocean cleanup estimates that more than 1,000 rivers account for 80% of global river plastic emissions to our oceans. The largest contributing countries are the Philippines, followed by India, Malaysia, China, and Indonesia. Despite the government efforts to clean the Sitarum River, they felt they were not addressing the real sources of pollution. So in October 2020, they launched Sungai Watch, a full-time river cleanup organization to clean the waterways in Bali, starting in Bali. They have deployed 160 floating barriers to date in Bali's most polluted rivers and 20 barriers in East Java. They now employ 120 river warriors and they operate six facilities to upcycle the trash they collect. 
Over two years of work, they have collected 700,000 kilograms of plastic. A single barrier can collect up to 500 kilograms in a single day. They collect three tons of plastic per day. If you try to imagine this, this will be awesome mathematics. Every month, Sungai Watch analyzes a sample of 15 bags for each plastic category. They have analyzed 500,000 pieces of plastic packaging. Sungai Watch also has its own uh, research and development. They have two hot presses to upcycle low-grade plastic, as we saw. And currently in Indonesia, they recycle 4% of the plastics consumed. Their target is twofold. As Gary said, his dream is to become 100% zero waste and to turn every plastic piece into something of value. And finally, to scale Sungai Watch across Indonesia. During our... Um, our uh, discussion with the two members of our panel, uh, there was a, um, a unity of a reaction to your work, Gary, by both Tony and James saying that this is a, a wonderful contribution that you're making to Mother Nature and to our, our Earth at this time in your life. So young and yet so committed. Uh, Tony Oposa likened uh, friendship to being defined as having shared passions. And the shared passion is the environment in your case. And um, he, I think Tony likes to use a lot of words. And here's what he said about the difference between possible and impossible. The difference is two letters, I and M. And he says that you uh, personify the I and the M because you made the impossible possible by removing yourself from the word and becoming a self-generating uh, environmentalist. He said that if I'm willing to do this, nothing is impossible. And you have proven that uh, time and again over the years when you started this mission of yours. Finally, he said, Hope is spelled H-O-P-E, which means heal our planet. And that's exactly what you're doing. Uh, James, on the other hand, said that once you get started on the environment, you are drawn in because it requires a personal commitment from the person who comes into, um, comes to work in the environment. He said that social media makes it more real, makes it very important and moving. And he was referring to the video that you presented where you had very vivid and almost shocking pictures of the, the trash that we find ourselves in. He said, it becomes something you cannot ignore. It stares you in the face, where if you go to a supermarket or to a market and you see the little sachets, it's just one sachet. But when you see it in the thousands and in the 700,000 kilograms that you collect, you cannot ignore that. He said, uh, James said, people who champions, who uh, champion the environment should not be afraid to dig in, to get dirty, to get rashes, to get wounds on your arms and your legs in the way that you have done, because they are constant reminders that the environment needs help. ADB he said, is realigning to invest in the environment, both upstream and downstream, because they have realized the importance and the, uh, and the fact that it is late in the day. Uh, we are entering an age of responsibility, in, in the words of James, when we cannot rely on other people, when we cannot only rely on Gary, but begin to point a finger at ourselves as being responsible. Everyone has a, um, has a responsibility to help with what we can do. And he did point out that from uh, deciding on the purchases that you make in the supermarket, all the way to the use of plastic bags and the way you dispose of it, all of us are responsibility for that. I have a responsibility for that. When the, the question was posited to you, Gary, are we beyond repair? Is, is the environment beyond repair? Have we reached a point where there's a point of no return? Um, 
it was suggested that media, the use of telephones that were not in existence so many years ago has helped bring and move the movement forward because people now see on their telephones and through other messages being sent to them, the urgency of the problem and the number and the scale at which we are being affected by this plastic pollution. Um, are we close to a point of no return? James says that with all of the wildfire fires, the climate change, the, the unpredictable weather, we are reaching a tipping point. But then um, he, he remains optimistic that there is a way in which we can reverse the tide in that direction. Tony Oposa said that when he reads the science, he feels hopeless because the science points at a continuing or a galloping move towards uh, not being able to reverse the trend. But when he sees Gary, he is hopeful. So Gary, you are not just a warrior, you're also a symbol of hope. Uh, Gary, um, Gary said in, in this discussion that when we let nature rest, it regenerates and that he feels that this is largely a human behavioral problem. It is not nature's fault because it can regenerate when given the chance. And the example he gave was when they removed uh, the barriers, nature regenerated, the waters became clean again like they were before and the, the uh, flora and fauna uh, came alive again. Um, he feels that the next two, three years are critical, that there might be a point at which we might reach that tipping point that James was referring to and not be able to reverse it. James said that COVID, for example, is a good example of the way nature was allowed to restore and to recover itself. He pointed out to uh, the skies becoming blue, um, the um, the plants growing lusher. And because of this, uh, what was removed from the equation was the human being. We were all locked down in our homes. And so we did not have the golden opportunity to destroy nature. Instead, nature took over and took care of itself. Um, he said, James said, we have to protect ourselves to help nature. And protect ourselves, I think what he, what he meant was this, was to analyze what we're doing uh, to destroy nature and protect ourselves from that kind of behavior so that nature will be gentle and kind to us and we can restore it back. Tony said, in the eyes of nature, humans are just another problem. And to restore nature, we have to remove the human beings from that equation. Uh, Gary said he feels that in the next decade, there will be a there, tripling of plastic consumption. And so the question remains, can we move faster than the tripling of that consumption? James said, what can be measured can be changed. And so now they are using data to uh, direct their aid, to direct their work in the ADB to be able to determine uh, where uh, help is needed. Uh, James also said that in the Paris Agreement, the um, climate change agreement in the Paris uh, conference, ADB is aligned with all of the uh, with all of the um, measures that the climate change agreement has agreed to. Uh, Tony said it boils down to how we behave, and I think we're all in agreement that uh, Gary, as he said, the emergency is here that we are in a emergency room situation. Everyone has a role to play. And finally, he did say that uh, it's time for us to look into the mirror and look into ourselves and try to examine what we're doing. And in so examining, um, uh, reverse the behavior, the bad behavior, uh, realign ourselves with what is good for us. In the questions to Gary, which Chicklet so very well uh, moderated, uh, he was asked, uh, are you uh, experiencing any resistance to the program that you had? And he said, um, yes, there is some resistance, but he has to, you have to manage safeguarding ego so that everyone is on the same page. Uh, you're talking to religious imams, you're talking to political leaders, 
you're talking to people of importance or perceived importance. And it is important for you to balance these uh, interests so that everybody is on the same page and that same page is saving the environment. You also said that data speaks volume. Uh, that 700,000 kilograms collected is, is nothing compared to the, um, the, the pace at which uh, plastic is being uh, let out and moving into our oceans. Uh, that the, the success of the rivers where barriers are removed are proof positive that your work is um, positive and gaining ground and if affecting uh, communities where they matter. James said, we need a generational change that every, um, every purchase, purchasing decision we make is a manifestation of our either good or bad behavior. Um, finally, as we close uh, today's session, that crazy idea of yours, Gary, made sense and allowed you and all of those in your Sungai Watch to move mountains of trash out of the rivers and back into usefulness. It needs a mindset change. You say it is a war against plastic. You are a, at war against plastics. You also remind us that respecting our rivers in the same way that we respect ourselves is essential in reversing the, the trend. Uh, you also said that you want to engage polluters in a conversation to move away from single-use, non-biodegradable plastics, and that you need ultimate conviction and persistence and the passion that has to be real and felt and manifested. It is your life's, life's journey and your motto is say no to plastic. On that note, I wish to uh, close this uh, rather rambling synthesis of mine and to turn you back to uh, Arma. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Cheche, so much for <laughs> synthesizing and summarizing our many takeaways in this afternoon's uh, panel session and also for leading our panel this afternoon. Thank you so, so very much. My, my pleasure. It's a, it's a real pleasure to meet a young man who starts his mission in life at 14. And since he's so young, he has a whole lifetime ahead of him. Good luck, Gary. Mabuhay ka. Truly, I think we really uh, chose a winner, another winner, Cheche. Yes, um, that, and uh, joined, choice. Yes, the Magsaysay Laureate group. So also to Tony uh, Meloto and of course, Mr. James Baker, the expertise and experiences you've shared, you know, as you promote and implement the environmental advocacies that you have in preserving and protecting mother nature has really sparked something, hopefully, in every listener and viewer that we have today to encourage us to do our fair share um, to the cost that we all need to be involved with, which is preserving and protecting our environment. And of course, to you, our shining star, Gary, Gary Benjigib, and the rest of the Sungai Watch team, thank you for joining us. Thank you for preparing this wonderful lecture. And uh, you truly have inspired us all. We cannot wait to see you in Manila in a few weeks. And I have to tell you, we, we are all very conscious here in Manila that we cannot have water bottles. <laughs> so we better have, you know, we better make sure there's no plastic around when Gary is here. So, <laughs> so we also have to thank the members of the Ramon Magsaysay Award Foundation Board of Trustees who we cannot do our work without. They are our wings and our, you know, our Magsaysay laureates who um, support all of our events. Thank you. And lastly, I also want to thank my wonderful RMAF team who are all behind the scenes, feverishly working to make all of these lectures happen, to make sure everybody is okay, um, especially Helen, as well, of course, I mean, I can't name everybody else, but they know who they are 
Uh, and to everyone that has joined us from the different parts of Asia and around the world, we had somebody from the Netherlands that, or Denmark that joined us either through Zoom, Facebook, YouTube. Thank you. And before we go, we Gary would like us to see Sungai's Watch video. Salamat. See you in Manila soon. Every single day, our patrol teams get out on the river from 7 a.m. and go to each of our barriers. Right then and then, they will take a photo before, take a photo after, and then separate between organic and plastic waste. All of that gets sent to our facility. And right now, we're bringing two tons of trash every day, where we sort it by types of plastics. It goes through an initial pre-sorting phase. At Sungai Watch, we really felt that there was a gap in data. When you look at plastic pollution, just the scale of it, it's so hard to really understand how big of a problem it is. And in Indonesia, one of the things that we're lacking tremendously behind is data. At Sungai Watch, we're collecting this data from the rivers of Bali. By placing our barriers, we're able to calculate each day per river the total amount of types of plastics. But another key metric is the brands. And doing brand auditing allows us to have a conversation with the bigger companies. The corporates that are somehow responsible for this plastics, using it in their packaging and in their products. This is just like a, you know, a, a normal Minimart scanner or just a shop scanner. And we have all of our sachets and so this shows up and it basically tells you uh, what product it is directly just from a scan. and be updated about Gary's work and his mission possible. Follow him on his Instagram account at Gary Benchigib. The Ramon Magsaysay Award Foundation has a lot in store for everyone this November. The next lecture will be the one by 2022 Ramon Magsaysay Awardee, Sovera Chim from Cambodia, next week on November 16, 2022 from 3 o'clock p.m. to 5 o'clock p.m. Manila time. You are all invited to watch the live stream of the 64th Ramon Magsaysay Awards presentation ceremonies on November 30, 2022 at 4.30 p.m. Manila time. We would like to thank the official media partners of the 64th Ramon Magsaysay Awards festival season, NHK World Japan, Ajans France Press, and ABS-CBN News. To be updated with all our activities, we invite everyone to follow the Ramon Magsaysay Award on social media. You will find us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, LinkedIn, and YouTube. Thank you very much for joining us and have a great day ahead. <laughs>